Let's get started. Uh, good evening and welcome to the 39th Annual Semiconductor Industry Award Dinner. So I'm President John Newfer, President and CEO of SIA. On behalf of SIA Board of Directors, thank you for taking part in this special evening as we celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Robert N. Noyce Award. Before we get down to the business of dinner, I'd like to recognize the uh, following corporate sponsors whose support helped make this uh, program possible. Intel Corporation, Micron, AMD, ASML, State of Indiana, KPMG, Maxim Integrated, New York Loves Nanotech, Qualcomm, and Texas Instruments. I'd also like to recognize the local FIRST robotics teams who demonstrated their projects during tonight's reception. And I think they're somewhere around here. We're going to get them up on the stage. Come on up, don't be shy. Come on up, no tripping allowed. All right. So, I don't know if you all had the opportunity to see the incredible work of these uh, future leaders of, of tech. We're very excited to have them here tonight. Uh, you certainly embody gracious professionalism, which is, uh, which is a key first value. Uh, wherein fierce competition and mutual gain can coexist. We like, to, we like that. Um, and uh, thank you for participating in this evening and giving us a glimpse into what the next generation of, of leaders is going to look like. Now, uh, it's a school night, and we've got to get you guys back home to finish your, your homework. Before we do that, before we, I say anything else, I just want to, if you want to hear more about what these kids are doing, uh, go to firstinspires.org. I think you'll enjoy the website. But for now, let's give a big round of applause for these future. Thank you. All right. Love it. All right. Um, with that, uh, please enjoy your dinner. We'll begin the program shortly. Thank you. Once again, please welcome SIA President and CEO, John Neufer. All right, a little more Bachman Turner Overdrive. I'm loving it. Uh, good evening, and thanks again for joining us. It's a pleasure to be with you to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Robert and Noyce Award, uh, the industry's highest honor. Uh, we're honored to be joined tonight by many former recipients of the award, icons who have shaped our industry's past and will help chart the course of its future. Tonight, we'll welcome to the stage SIA's incoming chair, Tunch DeLuca of uh, Maxim, John Kelly of IBM, he's sitting down at the table here, and uh, Martin Vandenbrink of ASML, who will receive the award. So Martin, I'm so sorry, we actually have a Dutch intern on board uh, this year, and he tried to help me say your name correctly, as hopeless failure, but he said, did say that I was pronouncing your first name, Martin, correctly, so. So uh, we'll also welcome three industry giants, uh, Craig Barrett, Morris Chang, and Ray Stata. Um, for an Oprah-style discussion about our industry's tremendous promise and the opportunities that lie ahead. One caveat, there will be no free cars given out tonight. <laughs> we gather tonight during a period of great transition of our industry, for our country and for our world. This week, the world watched as Americans voted into office President-elect Donald Trump. SIA is committed to working with the new administration and newly elected members of Congress to continue advancing industry priorities. We do so against the backdrop of a fastly evolving global economy and a steeper climb to maintain the, the breakneck pace of semiconductor innovation. Semiconductors are the beating heart of, the, of modern technology and our economy. The United States is home to a quarter of a million semiconductor jobs and more leading, ed, leading edge semiconductor manufacturing facilities than any other country in the world. We are the third largest, I like that, someone's clapping on that one. We're the third largest exporter of manufactured goods after cars and planes 
We are leading advancements in drones, AI, self-driving cars, and countless other emerging technologies. To reach our potential, we must speak with one voice, work together, and fight for policies that encourage growth and innovation. Earlier today, the SIA Board of Directors finalized uh, its 2017 uh, agenda. I'd like to highlight three core priorities. First, we must double down on our innovation agenda. Moore's Law recently turned 50, and it's becoming harder to maintain the rapid speed of scaling seen over the last five decades. This year, SI laid the groundwork for a new White House R&D initiative for semiconductor technology and helped advance some increases in funding for basic research. In 2017, SIA will continue to support federal investments in basic research and semiconductor research programs. Second, we must work to rebuild a new consensus on trade and ensure we have unfettered access to global markets. With 80% of our, of our customers overseas, open markets are essential to our survival. Despite the rising tide of anti-trade rhetoric, the truth is, Open markets mean a stronger American economy and more American jobs. Moreover, we have made some good progress on the trade front. SIA helped achieve landmark expansion of the Information Technology Agreement, a WTO agreement, which eliminates tariffs on $1.3 trillion in yearly sales of tech products, including advanced uh, MCO semiconductors. Now that's no small potatoes. Next year, we'll continue to fight for free trade in Washington and capitals around the world and work to rebuild the stuttering consensus on trade. Our third priority for 2017 is to defend the industry against outside risks. China's assertive steps to develop its own semiconductor sector stand out in bold relief. We welcome, com we welcome competition from China or anyone else, but we must ensure a level playing field where our companies can compete fairly. SIA has successfully encouraged the launch of a White House Experts Working Group on Semiconductors. It was announced just last week. We think the findings of this new group, due out around the end of the year, can help inform the incoming administration on how to ensure our industry can continue to thrive in the face of our challenges. I should also mention we very much welcomed the major policy speech last week on the importance of our industry by Commerce Secretary Penny Pritzker in Washington. I believe that's the first major public policy speech on our industry by a cabinet official in decades. So for 2017 and beyond, we are committed to working with the next administration and Congress in a partnership that keeps us at the tip of the spear of technological leadership. As we look to the future, I ask that you consider the past. Consider the great pioneers who founded our industry, many of whom are here tonight. Consider their commitment to unity, perseverance, and relentless, fo relentless focus on the future. And consider how their groundbreaking efforts can inform and inspire the semiconductor industry's next great breakthroughs and its next great leaders. As I close, let me thank you once again for taking part in this special evening. Together, I am certain the next 25 years will see the semiconductor industry rise to new heights and build a brighter future for our country and the world. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, and now it's my pleasure to introduce the man who will help lead us forward in 2017 as SIA's chair. Tunch is an accomplished engineer, a talented leader, and a tremendous champion for our industry. It's been a pleasure getting to know Tunch over the past two years when I joined SIA, and I look forward to your guidance as SIA's chair. So I want to thank, I also want to thank Nate Chip, where's Nate Chip down here? I want to thank Nate Chip of Intersil. <laughs> who is SIA's outgoing chair. He has been a huge ally over the past year, and unbelievably patient with me. Thank you. So please join me in welcoming our friend and colleague, SIS Chair, Tunch Delucha. Thank you.
All right, well, uh, thank you very much, John, for that intro. And Najib, also thank you for your services as chairman last year. Um, I know you must have been quite busy, uh, especially in the, at the end of that year. So um, good evening, everybody. Um, it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. And I hope you're enjoying this event, and I hope you uh, get a chance to actually say hello to some of the pioneers of this event. And this 25th year anniversary is actually great. So when I joined uh, Maxim back in 1984, I was a young analog design engineer. So I was really in the heart of this business, um, doing really old style analog design products. And I was always passionate about this. Uh, when I was in college, I used to tinker. I was, I guess, one of those nerds that was doing electronic stuff rather than partying. Um, but it was all great, but I had never imagined starting my job at Maxim that I'd be here chairman addressing this crowd. So it's a great, uh, it's a great honor and it's a great pleasure. And by some divine coincidence, it happens to be the 25th year anniversary uh, of the Noyce Award. So um, our industry obviously has experienced huge transformations uh, over the years. Uh, but one thing really has remained constant. The dynamic individuals that have really driven this industry. I think that's thing always has been constant. And when I think about the history of semiconductors, it's really all about those people. And many of them are here uh, with us today. They're hardworking, passionate, and committed visionaries in this industry. So take the so-called treacherous eight. I mean, just think about it. Um, if it weren't for Shockley and his book, Electrons and Holes in Semiconductors and Junction Transistors, if you think about it, if the treacherous eight, you know, had those young scientists has not left Shockley Semiconductor to form Fairchild, I don't know where we would be here today. Now the truth of it is they got driven out of that company by a, an interesting manager. But it, we'll forget about that. We'll just remember the good stuff about how they formed Fairchild. So when I look around today, I really see the same passion and inspiration in, in people that I see. Um, and I can imagine how it was for these eight young engineers at the Clift Hotel, really planning the future for themselves. Um, by the way, I would have loved to take some credit for that, but I wasn't born for about four months uh, after that event in 1957. Um, but I've actually lived that myself, and I'll tell you how. Um, I came to know a great uh, analog pioneer in our industry. His name was Jack Gifford. Some of you might know him. He actually was uh, the co-founder of AMD. He was the founder of Maxim. Uh, and he was the greatest storyteller that I've known. And in all of our business meetings, there was always some lesson that came out of those Fairchild days. So he'd sit us around and tell us the stories. And it was great because we learned about the things, the mistakes that were made, and not to make them ourselves. So it will always be my team, everybody that's worked for him, will be, always be grateful for those great stories that have told us. And I see Matt Murphy uh, nodding there. So he was in the group listening to that. So here we are, uh, thanks to the relentless pursuit and vision of our predecessors. And you've really transformed our industry. Many of them are actually sitting at the head table here. If you get a chance, you should really talk to these individuals. And today, as John said, you know, semiconductors are stitched into every piece of our lives. Many people outside of this industry don't realize that, but we really are the backbone of the whole um, technology sector and pretty much everything that we do. Uh, we use it, and I'll just quote from SIA, we enable the systems and products we use to work, communicate, travel, entertain, harness energy, Treat, treat illnesses, and make new scientific discoveries. We truly are part of everything we do. So we gotta make sure that everybody understands that uh, in the administration as well as Congress. Um, 
Today, the SIA is moving forward by advancing policy. Um, you mentioned uh, most of those, John. Thanks for doing that. But it's really in three groups. You probably noticed it. It's to uh, defend against threats. It's to expand our markets. And it's really to promote innovation. And maybe that last one is the most important for, to move our industry forward. And as your chairman this year, I will make it a priority to work with John and our vice chair, Mark, uh, to make sure that we advance those priorities. And especially with a new administration coming in, I think we have to be more active. So I ask all the CEOs to make sure that we do uh, talk about our cause uh, to the administration. So what do you do today to ensure that our industry thrives? I would say it's all about people again. I would say that we have to attract and cultivate a lot of young, new people into our industry. Uh, and I think that that is very important. We must attract them. We must show them our passion. We must tell them our stories, just like Jack Gifford did. So, Ray, I applaud you for writing the book you're writing about analog devices. I think it'll be huge uh, to tell those stories. Um, and that's the way we're going to move us forward. Now, we have to listen to these new entrants into our business. They're going to have a lot of crazy ideas. Are they going to sound crazy? But those, that's how innovation is made uh, in, our, in our world. So I ac accept this honor uh, as SIA chair for 2017. And I would like to express my gratitude for the SIA achievements and leadership through 39 years. I think next year is going to be 40. So we should be planning something for that, John. Um, and by working together, I think we have and will continue to innovate and achieve remarkable things for our industry and for the world. And so here's to everybody, past, present, and future, who have and who will uh, continue to make our world a better place. So thank you very much. Thanks, Tunch. Uh, we are excited about your leadership at SIA. Uh, before we turn uh, to the Noise Award presentation, I'd like to take this opportun opportunity to remember a semiconductor tra trailblazer and icon who we lost this year, Andy Grove. Life, whether it's an individual's life or an organization's life, is like a random walk. The random walk is a mathematical concept, but the best way to describe it is kind of a, if you took a picture, a videotape uh, of a drunk in a forest at night. <laughs> he starts walking in a particular direction, bumps into a tree, sits down, gets up, starts walking in another direction, and the process repeats itself. And the reason it, it is important to think about the, uh, that way is because the rules of operating in a random walk environment rules that make you successful in that are different than they would be if life, in fact, was a smooth, well-developed, well-planable entity. For many of technology's most admired luminaries and entrepreneurs, one man's random walk through life and business stands above all others as a model to be studied, appreciated, and emulated. I first met Andy after a series of pretty hard times at, at Facebook when a lot of people in his position wouldn't take the time to see me and he was always so generous. I've seldom come across people who have that ability to be so clear and then based on that insight to take action. Andy would participate on our board meetings by phone and there'd always be the point where you would hear in that deep voice on the phone, I have one question and one comment. And the whole room would pause because you kind of would get in your, um, your crash position, like what's coming here? Because there would be some wisdom combined with some big, you know, don't be so self-satisfied, combined with a question that would summarize all the challenges the organization was facing in like a five word sentence or a question. 
I got recommended high output management. And as soon as I like looked at the cover, I was like, wait a minute. Like he took the cover photo and he didn't take off his key card. Like for a cover photo on a book. It was the perfect photo for the book because yeah, that was Andy. Whether the story of Andy's incredible life and accomplishments truly was the result of a random walk, or as the rest of the world saw it, the result of uncanny vision, intelligence, and drive, it was a story that quite literally changed the world. What they might not know underneath was he was a very private man. I mean, his family came first, and he had a lot of, of his family, and he had a, he, he regarded Intel as a family, and, and he loved that too. I was never asked to join Intel. I don't really know, and he won't tell me whether he would have asked me to join Intel, because I didn't give him a chance. I said, I'm coming with you. That was the second best decision and the second best initiative I have undertook in my life in the United States. The first one took place approximately 10 years earlier when I met the girl, excuse me, the young woman who was to become my wife, who has stood by my side and most importantly taught me the meaning of constructive confrontation. <laughs> I wasn't really expecting to say anything. <laughs> so, um, but in the same fashion as he wasn't asked to go to Intel, he never asked me to marry. <laughs> With his passing, the technology industry has lost a true legend. And the world has lost a generous supporter and a champion of diverse and worthy causes. But the heart and spirit of the man lives on, and always will. You have to be alert to the fact that life is a random walk of opportunities, problems, threats, and unpredictable instances. And the only compass that you have to guide you through those bumps and encounters is your passion. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce the presenter of this year's Noyce Award. John Kelly is a luminary in our industry. He has driven technological advancements that have strengthened IBM and the entire industry. And he has been a tireless advocate for research and a trusted advisor to me and the whole SIA team. Please join me in welcoming our friend and former Noyce recipient, John Kelly. Thank you so much, John. 
Uh, this is a tremendous honor tonight to be here with so many friends, uh, but also all of the luminaries of our industry. And I want to just begin by thanking all of them because they have been a friend and a mentor to me over decades in this industry. Uh, just a tremendous group of people. We have with us tonight uh, a number of esteemed colleagues, but the colleague that I have here tonight to receive tonight's award, Martin Vandenbrink, is a very special person. I can't think of a better person in our industry to receive this award on our silver anniversary. Martin has been a true pioneer and visionary in the semiconductor industry. Without him, we simply would not have followed Moore's law. And furthermore, without Martin, we would have no hope of going to seven nanometers and below. There's a clear consensus that Martin has strengthened our industry and fundamentally advanced it in the area of lithography. But I think more importantly, Martin stands for being a great leader in our industry at the intersection of technology and business. Now I've known Martin, I told him I think 30 years, and he argues that. We started when we were very young, Martin. But uh, I met Martin in the mid 80s. And I've never met someone who is smarter, who understands the technology better, and understands our industry. We could sit for hours and talk about the physics of light wave fronts, fronts moving through lenses, and then quickly flipped to the industry and the economics of the industry. And in the end, we'd reach a decision together, shake hands, and do something great together. There aren't a lot of people in the world that you can do that kind of thing with. He's a dedicated and driven leader. His career is simply amazing. He started as one of the first employees at ASML, ASM Lithography, from the company's inception in 1984. He held various positions in ASML, up to and including being a member of the Board of Management in 1999. He was named the company's president and chief technology officer in 2013. He's a true trail, trailblazer. He took ASML from being a distant third in lithography to being number one in the lithography industry. And Martin, I remember those days when you were a distant third. I placed a very good bet on you. He's responsible for all of the technical decisions at ASML. He introduced the concept of modular design and open innovation in the 1980s. In the 1990s, he moved to something that was called step and scan. For those of us in the industry, we know how important that was for productivity. And then the twin scan dual stage in 2001, and I remember seeing the very early prototypes of that. But perhaps one of his most important innovations and where we had a partnership was in the area of immersion lithography in 2004. And that's the technology, ladies and gentlemen, that today carries the industry on its shoulders as we pursued Moore's Law. It remains the process of choice across the entire industry. Now, as I hinted earlier or said earlier, uh, he also is the driver behind the technology that will bring us into the following generations. Perhaps the most risky and yet the most important bet that Martin and his company have placed is on extreme ultraviolet lithography or EUV, where we can once again return to Moore's Law with single exposure and drive the economics of the industry again. And again, Martin has no fear, absolutely no fear. And the progress that's been made in EUV over the past several years is just simply stunning. Now to top it all off, in, in, uh, in addition to being one of the great leaders in our industry and the leader at ASML, uh, he is a member and a royal knight of the Order of the Dutch Lions. Very rare in, in, uh, in the Netherlands, a top, top recognition from the leadership of the con country. Now the Robert Noyce Award is the industry's highest honor. 
celebrating individuals who have had outstanding achievements on their own, but are also a leader across the industry. So Martin, I'd like to ask you to come up and join me. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the most brilliant, clear thinking individuals in our industry. Martin, thank you for all you've done for our industry. Thanks for being my partner and thanks for being my friend for nearly three decades. Congratulations. Uh, humble by all the nice words, I would not argue with the 30 years and all the achievements. I skip all that. The only thing I like to say that in these uh, circumstances, people like to honor individuals, but everybody understands it's not about the individual, it's about the team, it's about the company, it's about your customers. We have a number of them here in the ASML table, on the ASML table, not only from ASML, but also some of our key partners like Kyle's Eyes. We, I represent them all, and I will take this award in honor of all of us. Um, and I couldn't think uh, when I started today as ML in '84 that I would sit here and uh, be honored as the, as the highest award, and I feel very humbled to get to, to, to receive that. Now, I could dwell on, of course, for another 10 minutes on this. Uh, I have only 10 minutes, and I just feel the need of trying to share with you uh, how we get there and how we move forward, if you allow me to do so. And the industry we're in is not like the, uh, the beer industry, where it's only about volume, and we keep the recipe the same for 150 years. So we change our recipe on a frequent basis, and not only we as a company, a supplier to this industry, but also all of the customers. In order to do that, I'd like to go back where it started in 1958, where Robert Noyce, about the same time as Jack Kilby, were making the first integrated circuit. And I don't know uh, how these guys made it, how Jack created the chip, but I did look at the photo of the first chip and I counted about 50 pixels. And at the time, as most of you know, it was before I came into the industry, the, the chips were made by contact printing, by putting a mask and contact with resist and uh, do an exposure. And if we, Jack would make the uh, uh, circuits like that, he would be able to create a mind point point uh, chips with 50 pixel seconds. So that's my first, my first point on the chessboard. This is a terrible chessboard where everything doubles and everything. And at that time, in the 60s and 70s, when I was still at school, Chips were made by contact printing and proximity printing, creating huge issues for defects. And the first major step was in 1973, where uh, our partners of our, at that, kind, at that time, competitor per canal, were today part of ASML, our built -in operation. I would say some of the employees are still representing on the table over here from the 70s, Bill Alan Vitano running the place made this beautiful machine, the one-to-one um, uh, -one projection aligner, where you have the mask, one-to-one -one imaged on the wafer, both connected to a mechanical fixture, which you could manually move forward and create all of a sudden, going from 50 pixels a second to five megapixels a second and 100,000 X improvement. But again, 1973, I was still at school I know there are some people who were not at school at the time, but I was at school. So it was all done before I arrived. And even my next picture, which is the start of ASML when I joined ASML, I was being attracted to join ASML based on this picture. There was a little brochure being handed over by the HR department saying, hey, why do you join this? And I just saw the optics and the lenses and the stages and all of the complexity. And I did, took the job not based on the salary, not based on the company, but based on, on the picture. And this picture, this step and repeat thing, which was being pushed out by the previous machine, 
the aligner from Perkin Elmer, which was the success horse of the industry at the time, was able to boost this uh, to 60 megapixel a second. This is about uh, a factor 10x more than previously. So at that time, we're talking going from five, 50 pixels per second to a million more 60 megapixel seconds. It was already achieved when I joined the industry. So it looks to me almost hopeless to move forward beyond this point. Now, this is part of a more detailed presentation. I only allow 10 minutes, so I skip a few steps and I go immediately to today. Sorry, to today. And today, machines are looking like this. Uh, John already alluded to that, the dual state system. This today represents 15 terapixels a second, right? So compared to the 50 of the 60 megapixels, this is still uh, 250,000 faster. So in 32 years being part of the company, I have been part of creating this at that time when I started the miracle. By now, it's something very logical, improving the productivity 50x. And the trick of this tool is to do the metrology and the exposure at the same time in a way that you can uh, increase the economics use of the expensive lens and have enough time to do metrology. And yes, in between you also see the water meniscus driving down, moving forward. Okay, now this was about the past. Now, uh, how do we keep going this? And for doing so, I like to go back uh, how we work with customers today in driving, um, driving Moore's Law. And Moore's Law today has been questioned by many. And the reason, it, it, which frankly I don't understand because Moore's Law, I don't like to, dis, uh, to diminish whatever Moore, Moore, Gordon Moore was publishing in 1965, but Moore's Law, according to some, were already going on for 100 years. I mean, the calculation speed per second, starting with a mechanical computer with tubes, with transistors, integrated circuits already going on for 100 years. And likely, if you look to what drives today Moore's Law, yes, it's probably not only kinematical scaling on the left top, it's also device scaling. As recently as a number of years ago, Intel published the first changed device with FinFET, and likely multiple versions to come. Circuit scaling by combining chips uh, on an interposer, driving performance. This is a slide I took a bit from uh, Toshiba and, uh, and iMac, Luc van der Hoven. And I also like to add architecture scaling, where you, in this case, uh, I may give the example for memory, where solid state drive takes over massively as we speak from hard disk drive, and likely we'll see the storage class memory proliferating. So I believe if Moore's law is already going over 100 years, it's unlikely it will stop. And it will not stop, likely, because we all have smart engineers trying to innovate and move the wall moving forward. Like I joined in 1984, where I explained to you I was already facing trillion pixels a second speed, and I was still able to, over 30 years, to improve it to 250 miles. Not just do the same, but just innovate, create ideas, and innovate. Now, how does it work today? And I'd like to go there on the next picture, how lithography works today, and I, we call it holistic lithography, where it, holistic lithography exists not only about the stepper in, in the left-hand side, but also an integrated metrology who measure every wafer, have a computational model, and feedback whatever we measure back to the system and keep the process in its process window. In this particular case, we're able to shave off another nanometer over an on-product overlay in manufacturing. Now, for those, I see people who have been so long in the industry, with a one nanometer is a very small distance. Unfortunately for us, one nanometer is a very big distance. It's a substantial part of the overlay budget, and it kills the yield of a device of uh, today production. Now, what is the challenge of this? The challenge of this is being shown here. Here you see two wafers. By the way, you show also the today champion data on the EUV. Uh, John alluded to that. Today we can demonstrate champion data on an NXT of less than a nanometer overlay. Now, this overlay of one nanometer can be challenged, but you see that in measuring 100 points per wafer, these are two wafers, you see hardly the pattern 
uh, of what the nature of the ovary is. On the right hand side, I included a picture where somebody could argue. In fact, this should start here. Argue with 100 points and then with 200. Oh, Lilla. Too, too sophisticated. So this was 100 points with 200 points and even the 300 points, the limit of practical uh, metrology time, you cannot reconstruct the whole image. And this is just driven by the economics. A fab is made not because of doing metrology. A fab is made is producing wafers. And metrology is just to support it. That means the fundamental limit how much time you can spend in metrology. So in order to understand what's going on, you need more than, uh, than just sampling data. You need to have a model, and only a model will enable you to create the truth. This, ha this went wrong past week, whereas several people were making predictions based on a very spare poll in the United States, time to predict who will be next president. <laughs> and what was failed is that the model has changed. And so nobody could predict what the right outcome would be, and still everybody is surprised why it happened what happened. In this particular case, we keep our pride on making sure that we do the right model and try to predict what's going on in the wafer. Now, we're taking this now the next step, where we now add to the metrology, optical metrology yield star, also the scanner metrology, generate data every wafer, create a model, predict from that model where potentially defects or pattern fidelity defects occur, check with a SEM system, which over time will be likely a fast multi e beam SEM, but still a slow system, get back to the model and do a feedback control. Data gathered at IMAC looks like this, where you get a focus map, CD map, you get a hotspot simulation, you create a predictability of those hotspots, create to pattern fidelity errors, where then the EBIM system go behind and you create a feedback loop, potentially reducing 50% of the error. And this is the kind of way will bring us to the leading edge and bleeding edge sub nanometer accuracy. Now, this is then summarized in this graph where you see three cornerstones again. The stepper, the metrology, the computational model, with application products by controlling the process window on the left-hand side, process window control on the right-hand side, and giving context to the metrology, which is the, the trouble area in the factory, because you're not having a factory doing metrology, you have a factory to produce wafers. With that, and that will be my last slide for people who expect me to go on for half an hour, which I'm not allowed to do, is my final slide, my promise to the industry, that yes, we do have four engines of Moore's law likely to continue for some time to come. My pledge to this industry is that we will drive this whole thing with EUV to half a pentapixel a second to allow the industry with the other engines in part to drive Moore's law to, for the next eight years. As some of you noticed, we made an announcement Last week, investing 1.7 billion in our partner, Carl Zeiss, to develop these advanced things running with high NA, sub 10 nanometer lithography, single exposure, up to 200 wafers an hour. With that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Martin, and once again, congratulations on this well-deserved honor. Uh, Martin uh, has joined an elite group of Noyce Award winners, a who's who of industry founders, icons, and leaders. Now, to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the award, we'd like to recognize all the recipients of the last 25 years. At a frenetic pace, semiconductor innovations have led to things like space exploration, personal computing, the internet, improved national security, DNA sequencing, venture capital businesses, and the global ubiquity of mobile phones. In 1991, the Robert N. Noyce Award was created to honor innovators and big thinkers who had transformed our world. Canyon set in motion the idea for a 28-pound luggable computer. A few years later, Compaq became the number one PC Ross led the team that discovered how to make very thin silicon wafers. Galvin helped make cell phones accessible for all. Prophesying exponential innovation, Moore co-founded Intel. Q 
Kilby was an inventor of the integrated circuit and winner of a Nobel Prize. In the 1960s, Fairchild Semiconductor became an incubator for industry superstars. It brought together Noyce, Moore, Spork, Sanders, and Corrigan. Spork was a driving force for R&D consortia Semitech and the Semiconductor Industry Association. Barshevsky led U.S. negotiations to open markets and paved the way for the World Semiconductor Council. Pioneering entrepreneurs Sanders and Corrigan brought the semiconductor industry to international prominence. Facing intense competition from Japan, Noyce, Spork, Sanders, and Corrigan met at Ming's restaurant in Palo Alto to start SIA. Block developed IBM System 360. The mainframe was essential for NASA and the FAA. Fajin, Mazur, and Hoff invented the microprocessor at Intel. Their innovation is now the nerve center of modern electronics. Unifying through SIA, the U.S. industry came back strong in the 1980s and 1990s. Stata spearheaded education reforms and inspired future generations of engineers. Pataki built a model for government industry collaboration. Barrett is an industry statesman, championing education, research, and technology. Weber advanced investments in education and international trade deals. By the 2000s, semiconductors were a global economic driver and specialists thrived. Morgan focused on manufacturing systems. Now nearly every chip worldwide is produced with their equipment. Jacobs and Viterbi developed CDMA mobile technology and pushed advances in satellite communication. Chang started the first dedicated semiconductor foundry, transforming the industry. Kelly pushed into the realm of cognitive computing with IBM Watson and is a tireless champion for research. Scalise led SIA for over a decade pursuing a robust research agenda. Appleton strengthened America's position in the memory market. In recent years, Templeton championed STEM education, research, and open trade. Splinter promoted advanced manufacturing. Dana united the industry around common challenges. Now, semiconductor innovation is pushing into the subatomic realm with billions of transistors on a single chip. Holt fostered the development of 22 nanometer technology. Vandenbrink drove three decades of important improvements in lithography. Winners of the Robert N. Noyce Award have made the impossible possible and transformed our world. The most exciting opportunities lie ahead, just beyond the next discovery. Wow, that was an excellent tribute to the legends and leaders of our industry. So some of the individuals featured in the video are, are not with us tonight, but, but many are. So I'd like to ask the noise recipients in attendance to please stand to be recognized. And let's, let's give a big applause. Thank you. We have a, a small token of appreciation that will be passed out uh, right now uh, to the Noise Awardees. Thank you very much. Now it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage some very special guests, all Noise Award recipients. Craig Barrett, Morris Chang, and Ray Stata. Please, kind of, please come on up to the stage. Thank you. that born to run. Well, uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. Uh, Craig Barrett um, is a longtime leader of Intel and a peerless ambassador for the industry. Uh, Ray Stata, co-founder co of Analog Devices and has been a mainstay of our industry ever since championing research investments um, and other initiatives. And of course, Morris Chang, founder of the first semiconductor foundry, TSMC, and revolution, revolutionized our industry. So wow, it's great to have you guys up on stage this evening. 
Um, when I have a Oprah style discussion, as I said, I'd like to kick off with a first question. So you've all been leaders in, in the industry. You've all helped to advance Moore's law, uh, pushed innovation to its limits. What's your perspective on the future of technology challenges facing our industry and prospects for continued innovation and growth? I mean, that's kind of an open-ended question. Who would like to take that first? Craig? Craig, I think we're all looking at you. <laughs> OK. Um, I joined Intel in the industry roughly 45 years ago. When I joined, uh, Moore's Law was on its last leg. <laughs> <laughs> Again. Nothing's changed. Uh, so what I learned over that period of time and the opportunity for the industry is uh, if you continue to ignore the financial analysts, that's very important. Uh, you continue There's a few to here tonight, by the way. Uh, you continue to invest. You continue to uh, hire the best and brightest out of our research universities from around the world. Uh, they'll find solutions. And we, we heard tonight uh, uh, from a lithography standpoint, OK, we've got three or four more generations to go, but we always just have three or four more generations to go, so I'm not discouraged by that. I'm encouraged by it. I'm encouraged by the, uh, the potential, uh, not potential, but the oncoming integration of both photonics and electronics at that level so that you can get communications chip to chip or on board chip, same speed that you can get a transistor switching. Uh, I'm encouraged by the, the continued marriage of biology and engineering or biology and electronics. I think it's a limitless future. So, you know, 45 years ago, we only had about one more generation to go. We're still here. It's pretty good. Great. Thanks, Craig. Ray Morris, uh, you want to jump in? Ray, you look like you got something to say. Yeah. Ray Morris. No. I, I think that uh, there will be uh, a lot more innovations yet. Um, as far as Moore's Law is concerned, um, I think people have been predicting the demise uh, for many years. I remember, in fact, um, 1999, I think it was, uh, there was a panel in uh, Taiwan, and uh, Craig and I were the only two panelists uh, and uh, somebody asked, uh, how long is Moore's Law going to go on? And I said at that time, 15 years. This was 1999, 15 years, I said. And Craig, you know, was more thoughtful. And he went like this for a while. He said, maybe 10 years, he said. <laughs> <laughs> well, now it's uh, 2016. And I really think that um, our struggle for um, uh, higher density is going to go on for at least 10 more years. Uh, middle 20s, uh, middle 2020s, uh, let's say 2025. And uh, I think by then we'll have uh, something uh, like the three nanometer going. I think that uh, we'll, we'll go that far at least. Uh, and then uh, aside from uh, uh, Moore's law, and we have uh, uh, what's what's generally called more than more, you know, and, you know, um, embedded flash, uh, microcontrollers, and uh, memories, and uh, so on, uh, memories, memories and logic together, and also uh, three-dimensional packaging uh, uh, and uh, that type of things. Uh, they will go on for, for quite a while yet. So anyway, I think there's a lot of innovations yet uh, in the semiconductor industry. Thanks, Morris. Uh, Ray? Yeah, well, let me give you the perspective from somebody from the analog technology world, uh, which is quite uh, different. The industry was born basically as uh, component uh, manufacturers, whether that was memories or processors or op amps or converters, they were, you know, specialty functional circuits. That's how we were born. Uh, 
And what I see this profoundly different as we go into the future is the whole industry is making a transition from a kind of a component orientation to a system solution orientation. Now there's some parts of our industry that are well down that path, particularly as it relates to you know, uh, smartphones uh, and, and, and the high volume uh, part of our industry is, is already there and is going forward from there. But I'd say the center of the gravity of the semiconductor industry, at least seen from the perspective of an analog person, is still in the midst of that transition from a component mentality to a system solution mentality. Now, <clears throat> there was a guy by the name of uh, Brian Arthur, who was a student of, the, of, of, of technology and the evolution of technology. And he made the observation that in the uh, in many different uh, waves of technology, in the early days, uh, it was just very much like our industry. Uh, it, it starts out with particular uh, innovations, breakthroughs uh, in the particular uh, different uh, functional specialties. Uh, and then over time, uh, the, the, the focus of the industry is to, to multiply those in innovations by the hundreds and the thousands. You know, it took 50 years from the flight of the Kitty Hawk to the first trans, you know, trans, uh, Continental DC-3, 50 years. And I think the same thing with the semiconductor industry. It's been 50 years along. And we're coming to grips with what uh, Brian uh, Arthur uh, described as a transition to combinational innovation, as opposed to, you might say, more bottoms-up uh, technology-focused innovation. And we see this being manifest today in terms of uh, the Internet of Things, whatever that means. Uh, we see that in SOCs, we see that in the solutions that are already existing in the industry. So from, from my perspective, the, uh, the, the, the future is the, the, I think Brian made the observation that there's a tipping point uh, when you go from, you know, kind of bottoms up innovation to what he called combinatorial innovation. And that is you take the existing technologies that are already out there and you put them together in various combinations. It's not to say that there isn't room for pushing the state of the art to improve the performance of systems, but really the, the, the impact on society, on how we live and work, uh, comes more from the combinations of existing technologies than they do necessarily from adding more and more of the details. So there's sort of an explosion, there's a tipping point, I think we begin to see that. And my own view of the world is that uh, the, 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 the movement toward, uh, you know, system solutions uh, will provide the platform and the basis for the creation of whole new companies, whole new industries, uh, in a way that will extend the opportunities of this industry uh, for times to come. Thanks, Ray. We don't have much time. I want to ask a couple of quick questions. Uh, uh, one, one of them is this industry is always described as a cyclical industry. In fact, an industry that it's, there's never a dull moment in this industry. And the recent wave has been towards uh, significant consolidation over the past 18 months, two years. As someone who runs an association that presents challenges to me as, a, as the pool to fish from for our members gets smaller. but I. We'd love to hear from you about where you think this is going to go, the, the consolidation, and what the industry is going to look like in five years, ten years. Morris, you want to take a shot at that? Um, I think it's, con it's going to con consolidations and mergers are going to continue uh, to happen. Well, how successful they will be, I don't know. I imagine that uh, some of them are going to be successful, but uh, some really are not. Um, um, is, is it going to make a different industry? Uh, yes, I think it'll be different. Actually, semiconductor industry is maturing. So you, I mean, the growth rate uh, has slowed down. Uh, I, I 
looked up some statistics uh, prior to uh, 2000, the, the 10 years, 1991 to 2000, um, the growth rate was 16%, compounded annual growth rate. 2001 to 2010, the growth rate was uh, 6%, compounded annual growth. 2011 to 2016, annual compounded annual growth rate, 3%. You know. So that shows the, the maturing of the industry. And, uh, and you would expect uh, consolidation in, in the maturing phase of the industry. So I, I, I don't think it's a surprise. And uh, I actually uh, think that uh, uh, it's something that we, we need to be prepared uh, for it to happen. Craig, do you want to grab the crystal ball and take a shot at that question? Yeah, well, I used to think the uh, semiconductor industry was cyclical, and then I, when I retired, and I now raise cattle in Montana. You want to talk about <laughs> a cyclical industry? The beef industry is cyclical, makes the semiconductor industry look mild. Uh, I'm bullish on the industry. I have been my whole career, and I see no reason to take a bearish position at this time. I think there's immense opportunities. I mentioned my earlier comments. I think the marriage of electronics and photonics is just starting. And that'll be a, an extension of Moore's law uh, with the marriage of two distinctly different technologies. A huge opportunity there. The marriage of biology and engineering, I think, is another huge area which just hasn't been touched yet. And if you can marry onto all of that the continuation of Moore's law in some form, you know, whether it's Martin talked about what 0.45 petapixels. That's almost an obscene term, actually, <laughs> Martin. <laughs> but you know, th that's where you are today. In another uh, few years, you'll be up in, you know, 50 petapixels or something like that. And, it, industry's going to continue. It'll continue until it reaches the top of this S curve where you. The, the investment doesn't give you an adequate return, and then there'll be another electronic switch of some sort that comes along. By the way, my opinion has always been that there's a tremendous amount of background in the semiconductor industry. You know, the 19 layers of metal and interconnect you can put down on a silicon wafer. All that that does is connect all of the electronic switches, the transistors below it. If you can shrink that switch, whether it's a quantum dot or something else, you can then extend the technology beyond. I think infinite an amount of uh, possibility going forward. I'm bullish. As a Montanan, I'll say I'll ride that horse. Thank <laughs> you. Ray? Yeah, well, to continue my theme of you know, system solutions, if you're going <clears> to <throat> uh, produce a, a, a whole system on a chip, it takes quite a breadth of technology. So I think uh, you know, one of the forces at play here is that in order to uh, ad address the opportunities for more systems-oriented products, you have to have you know, a tremendous uh, uh, breadth of, of technology to do that. And so that's one of the forces that's driving this integration. The other point is, if in fact it's true that we're making this transition from components to systems, I think there's an overcapacity in, at, the, at the component level in terms of development. And uh, we're, we're, we're sort of overcompeting with each other. So another force at play is if, in fact, you want to move upscale to the systems level, uh, then uh, you, have to, you have to kind of shrink your investment on the component side. So another force at play here is to, is to re is reduce the redundancies that exist in terms of the design resources that are out there so that we can go upscale to more systems-oriented products. And those products are not just silicon. Uh, they're software, they're algorithms, there's packaging, they're, they're very complex aspects of the transformation into a systems industry. And we've got to give up some of the things that we did before, and one way to do that is through consolidation. Thanks, Ray. So uh, last question, we had uh, some bright, shiny, young, future engineers on the stage here tonight. Um, uh, Silicon Valley is drawing 
a lot, lot, lots of talent. A lot of that talent is going into uh, social media. Um, I guess my question to, to you guys is, uh, what advice do you have for students uh, in STEM fields and entrepreneurs considering a career in this fine industry? Morris? I, I think uh, I would probably advise them to um, uh, look at the, the newer areas, uh, the areas that uh, uh, hold uh, more promise uh, now uh, than, um, than just the hardware. Uh, I will certainly advise them to look at the software more, look, advise them to look at computer science more, and uh, also advise them to look at the internet more. Uh, that would be my advice. I, uh, I know that uh, a lot of uh, uh, fabs still want to hire more engineers. They, uh, well, I, I kind of think that, uh, you know, uh, the requirements for fab engineers uh, will probably uh, be pretty stable, I think, uh, uh, for a while. And I think the growth areas uh, will be in those other areas, mm -hmm. software and internet, yeah. You know, the, 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 the platform for these new emerging and exciting uh, <clears throat> industries and companies really is semiconductor. So right. behind it all, right, is, is, uh, is what we do as an industry to facilitate that. Now, <clears throat> what that creates is uh, uh, crowding in terms of uh, uh, competition for talent and competition for financial resources. And I think we see that going on. And the place uh, we're in particular that's troublesome is that the universities now, uh, you know, the electroengineering departments are shrinking <laughs> uh, to make room for all this other grand stuff. And, and yet we need people who are trained and educated uh, to be able to do the things that, that we're interested in. So I think one of the uh, challenges is to recognize that. And the question is, how do, we, how do we compete in this market? What do we do differently? And from that point of view, we're not going to get as many electrical engineers as we used to get. Uh, and so we're maybe going to have to take a different approach in terms of more, uh, taking on more of the burden of education ourselves to make sure we get our share of it. You know, we have to be in the face of the people in the universities to make sure they understand what our needs are. Uh, so that they're, they're not walking away from the things that we need. Uh, so I think that there's a, a, a very uh, uh, great opportunities created in these new spaces, but it also creates troubles for us in getting the, the capital and getting the, uh, the people that we need to continue uh, to, to grow. Now, uh, this, the financial community has pretty much given up on uh, startups in the semiconductor industry. Uh, there's still a few of them that pop out and go forward, but it's harder and harder and harder uh, to get that money. Uh, so we're going to have to be innovative in terms of how we do that as well. Now, it's interesting, I don't know how many of you have seen the announcement of MIT of a program called The Engine. And in recognition of, of this dilemma, uh, in terms of the availability of, of financial resources. MIT is setting up uh, a program, it's really an incubator, uh, where they will become, you might say, a venture capitalist and drawing in money uh, to make sure that the things that take a longer gestation period and, and, and deeper uh, time and money, uh, that they can contribute as, as part of the mission of the university. So I, I think we're... Uh, uh, th that, that phenomenon that you mentioned is a, is a troubling one for our industry. How do we get the people we need? How do we get the money we need uh, to continue to go forward? Startups uh, are still popping out of universities, uh, and I think uh, in, it's increasingly difficult for a startup to go all the way and become a major player in this industry. So I think increasingly there's issues about intellectual property, uh, uh, licensing, uh, most of them get acquired, uh, but nonetheless, the startups are the most efficient way uh, for the translation of uh, nascent 
technology and universities into the commercial world. So, you know, that's got to continue. And I think in the industry, we have to think more about how do we encourage that. Maybe it's through corporate strategic investment. Uh, maybe it's uh, new models uh, to make sure that these startups can get the money they need uh, to create the innovations and the, and the bottoms up technologies that we need in the future. Thank you. Craig, you're going to get the last word. Any country western uh, insights for us? Any more? Well, you know, in the introduction to this evening, you showed an uh, image of Bob Noyce with one of his quotes, which was basically said, forget about history, go off and do something wonderful. If you're going to talk to young people today in, in any of the technical areas, whether it's startup or classic semiconductors, whatever it is, you got to tell people that there's immense opportunity everywhere. Do what really turns them on. Focus their energy and effort on something they love doing. And they can be successful at it. Because there's immense opportunity everywhere. There's immense opportunity, got, you know, there's the next Facebook is going to happen. And, you know, you're going to get a billion users overnight. And it's no infrastructure because it's already there. Uh, but somebody's also going to figure out how to you know, make the next electronic switch. And that's going to change the mm -hmm. world. So you tell people, get the best education you can, and then forget about history, just do something wonderful. Just go out and make it happen, because the opportunity is there. Uh, so, I, uh, you know, I'm happy about the future, I think. We just had an election, <laughs> didn't we? I guess I'm happy about the future. <laughs> but, but, you know, Nobody predicted our last election. Those pundits are just as accurate as all those folks saying Moore's Law is on its last leg. So let's leave it on that high note. That's a great way to do it. Thanks, Craig. So, Craig, I'm sorry, Ray, go, go ahead. I guess you're going to get the last word, Ray. Pardon? You said you want to add one last word? Uh, no, I, I, was, I was just going to say, in, in terms of this dilemma of how do we get the resources that we need, I think uh, one of the things that we have to do is, is be more aggressive as an industry of going to the universities and make sure they know we're here, uh, create internships, uh, uh, create uh, different uh, ways of making sure that we get more than our share of those scarce resources on the engineering campus. So I think it's a real challenge uh, for, to the industry. One of the solutions is to set up design centers. Uh, you go to India, go to Czechoslovakia, go wherever. There's great engineers and you tap into that resource. Uh, and we're doing that and we're gonna have to do even more of that. But at the same time, the jewel, of the, one of the jewels of this industry are the research universities and the people that they turn out. And so we've got to make sure that we get our share of that. Thank you, Ray. Craig, Ray, Morris, thanks so much for joining us, and thanks for the other speakers. Uh, congratulations again, Martin. Um, just uh, one, one, one announcement. We are having an after party right outside the doors here. I want to thank uh, uh, Micron and Intel uh, for hosting that party. Uh, and we also have a very interesting cake out there I ask you all to gaze, put your eyes on. And we'll have a bit of a champagne cho toast, um, so I, I, I think you shouldn't miss that. Um, once again, good night, everyone, and thanks again for joining us. Morris. <laughs>